Welcome to episode one of the Bitcoin Worldview podcast. I'm your host, August Olofsson. With training in music, software engineering and theology, I have found studying Bitcoin changing my thinking in several areas. In the Bitcoin Worldview podcast, we ask the question, what can Bitcoin teach us about how to understand the world around us? In other words, don't blindly trust your worldview, verify. In this first episode, our guest is Jimmy Song, a well-known advocate of Bitcoin for many years. Keep in mind that you can join the conversation for the next episode on Zoom. Just sign up on our website, bitcoinworldview.live. Feel free to share that website with others. You can also join our group on Telegram by searching for Bitcoin Worldview. Telegram is useful to continue the conversation, and we also welcome any feedback that you might have. Thank you for joining us, Jimmy. You are one of those guys that are outspoken and uh, really have been uh, uh, influential in my journey, I would say, uh, both from the Thank God for Bitcoin book, uh, who you authored with uh, several other guys uh, and girls, I believe. Uh, you have been in the Bitcoin world. Well, I'm going to ask you about that, but <laughs> longer mm. than I have. And uh, uh, you are active on Twitter and you are active on speaking on conferences. You've done some coding. And uh, from, my, what, from what I am picking up, uh, you, uh, you believe strongly that this has the potential to really change our world. Uh, I think that's not, not too big. So... Thank you for joining us, and uh, yeah, welcome. Well, thanks for having me. It's going to be fun. Hopefully, we can talk about some metaphysics and Bitcoin, uh, some topics I like talking about. So yeah, let's let's get get going. It's going to be fun. All right. So uh, my first question, uh, I'm going to just shoot Jimmy some questions, and we're going to do it that way. Uh, when and how did you first hear about bitcoin how did that come about yeah 2011 february so about 10 and a half years ago uh, i read a story on slash dot um and i believe it was the first story mentioning bitcoin ever on slash dot i used to be a very loyal reader it was bitcoin has reached dollar parity something like that i remember reading it and not knowing anything about it and so I, um, I did some research and I found out there was a 21 million limit. And very soon after, I was just like, okay, I think I need to get some of this. I, I was convinced almost as soon as I found out it, there was a 21 million limit. I didn't know anything else. I had a vague idea of how it could work, but I didn't, I didn't really uh, know it at the time. Uh, but of course, like trying to buy it back then was extremely difficult. You had to transfer money to one of like three exchanges in the world and they were all very difficult to get money to um uh but uh and so i ended up not doing it so one of the biggest uh, regrets in my life uh because it had just reached a dollar so um yeah but that that's that's uh, like we we all have stories like that so um but yeah, that that's when I first heard about it. And, uh, you know, like a couple of years later, I got into it a lot deeper coding and, you know, working for Bitcoin and things like that. Um, like as in I got paid in Bitcoin to do some work, that sort of thing. Um, so, yeah, it, it's it's been a pretty long journey um, and yeah, never thought it would uh, lead to stuff like this, but it is what it is. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm curious, you said that when you realized it had that 21 million mm -hmm. fixed, that immediately caught your attention. Had you been looking at our monetary systems and the weaknesses of that, you know, expanding supply before and that, did that click for you because of that? Yeah, um, I, I've uh, had libertarian leanings, I think, since 2008. Um, you know, I, I, I went through that and I remember just thinking, hey, how is it possible that they could print this much or like, where, where is this money coming from? Mm. 
Uh, you know, I think in the U.S. at least there was the TARP bailout, which ended up being like eight hundred billion dollars, uh, which doesn't sound like that much now, but at that time it just it sounded absolutely huge, right? Like eight hundred billion dollars—that's like an insane amount of money. Where, like, how, how, like, where is this coming from? Um, and uh, and then I, you know, I, I started learning about how the Federal Reserve worked. And fractional reserve banking and things like that, and I realized it was uh, all sort of a big shell game. Um, so when I heard about this and the twenty-one million limit, which is enforced by computer code, I was like, okay, that's actually scarce. So this is, and there, there was almost sort of like um, an instinctual desire for it. I think it's like inbuilt to every human being to want something that's actually scarce. Um, hmm. You know, one of the best ways to sell something to somebody is to say, this thing is actually really rare or, you know, <laughs> there aren't that many of those. Uh, and it's tapping into that same instinct. We, we have a natural desire for things that aren't in abundance. So, uh, you know, that, that, that played a part of it. But, yeah, I mean, uh, of course, I didn't necessarily listen to it enough to set up my Dwala account and my Mount Gox transfer and do all the AML KYC that needed to be done in order to buy it. But, you know, at least I had an idea. I'm, I'm comparing this in my mind to my own journey because I looked at Bitcoin back in 2011, 2012, but I didn't look hard enough. I didn't connect the dots and I had not done any studies in economics and uh, money printing, and and that didn't, you know, I didn't didn't catch catch on for me. Uh, did in those days when you started looking into Bitcoin, 2012, 2013, did it start to change how you how you thought, how you understand the world around you, or was it more just contained in in the Bitcoin world? Um. Definitely started affecting me by like 2014, because um, by then I think I understood. Okay, this is really good sound money. This is a store of value. It, it's something that you can keep for a long time. Um, I started to change my habits, um, and you know, like there, there were a bunch of other things going on in my life at the same time that I think contributed to it. Uh, but you know, part of it was this experience in 2013 where. I uh, I was contributing to an open source project in return for Bitcoin. So what was happening was I saw a an ad on jobs for Bitcoin. It was a Reddit subreddit back in 2013. Uh, I I'm not even sure if it runs anymore. Uh, but uh, basically, somebody uh, you know, people were mostly posting, "I'll do this service for Bitcoin." But there was wanted Python developer. I was like, and we'll pay in Bitcoin. I was like, all right, I, I'm in. Um, and basically, I messaged the guy back. Uh, turns out that it was a guy in the Ukraine, and he wanted some developers for his co colored coins project on uh, on GitHub. I was like, sure, like just tell me what to do, and you know, we'll we'll figure it out. Gave me some work. Um, I was motivated by the Bitcoins that I was earning. So I quickly sent it back to this day. That's probably some of the best like per hour money I've ever made. Right. Cause <laughs> I was getting paid in Bitcoin. Um, and I, I, and you know, I was like, okay. But, and this was like in October of 2013 when price was going up dramatically, like every day, right? Like it went from a hundred bucks on like October 1st to like the high, like November, November 8th or something like that to 1100 or something. It was, it was like a heady time. So I was especially motivated and I was, uh, you know, doing everything I could, uh, to, to make money on doing that. So I kept asking for more work and like the other people he had hired, they were, you know, slow or couldn't get it done or had other obligations or whatever. So he gave me a lot of work. He, he, was, he just kept going, okay, you're done with this project. He gave me a bigger project and I, I just kept doing it. So at, at one point I was like working like 40 hours a week at my normal job and 40 hours a week doing, <laughs> doing this. And it was, it was kind of a crazy time. Right. It, uh, and, I was like, okay, this is kind of getting unsustainable. Um, 
And that experience of just sort of like, like being a market participant, which sounds kind of strange, right? Because, uh, you know, I, uh, like, I've been working at startups all my life and worked for companies at very of varying sizes. Uh, but I had always been a salaried employee. Um, I mean, yet you'd have to go back to like college and high school where I was like an hourly employee or whatever. But it was it, it was kind of a big shift in mentality for me because it was like, okay, well, I'm actually providing something somebody wants and I'm getting paid for it. Um, and I, I, I've come to realize like uh, much later in like 2017, when I went off on my own and started my own business and stuff that, um, you know, that that's like actually much more normal to the human condition, like working for yourself and getting paid for a good or service that you can provide rather than sort of like working in these companies, which honestly are a lot like socialist institutions, right? You get paid a fixed amount. and you know, like uh, your opinions and loyalty and things matter way more than like your actual ability to do useful work. Um, so I think that that was a big sort of like mental shift for me. And I'm not sure if it was entirely Bitcoin, but Bitcoin certainly contributed to it. And like by by 2017, especially going off on my own, that um, that changed my perspective significantly because I was like, Wow, there's a lot of stuff that I could do that people will pay money for. Uh, you know, I can publish books and I can, you know, speak at conferences. I can hold like carnivory dinners and people come. And it's it's just like, you know, stuff I never expected to make money, but it was like, yeah, let's try it, see what happens. Um, and you know, like helping people for coins or whatever, like just random stuff. Um and I, I think that gave me a very different perspective on like what it means to be a market participant and uh, you know, like what, what it feels like to be in a truly free market. It really does change your incentive structure because it's all about providing value to other people. And to this day, like, you know, whenever I'm offered a consulting engagement, like the first question I ask is, okay, what value am I providing? Cause mm -hmm. like, if it's not, like if I'm not providing any value, I'm not going to take your money. It's a, it's not, doesn't make any sense. Uh, you know, they might just want my name or something like that. In which case I'm like, no, that's, that's not enough value that, or that's not value that I want to necessarily provide uh, is, you know, lending my name to some project or something like that. It's uh, you know, I'm, I want to actually provide value uh, instead of a sort of being a rent seeker or that, just sort of collects a paycheck for doing nothing. I think uh, that for me has been a major shift in my mentality uh, of making sure that I, uh, I'm doing something that's worthwhile to somebody else if whenever I am getting paid. That's very interesting. So you're really saying that, well, are you saying that we can expect to see growth in this peer-to-peer -peer mentality where where people really are working directly, you know, based on on the value that they can they can offer. Yeah, uh, I, and I think that's the normal free market <laughs> work, right? Like if you're if you're in a free market and you're, uh, you know, providing a good or a service, the thing is, like, you, you start thinking like an entrepreneur. It's like, you know what? Like people keep asking me to do this. Maybe I should just charge money for it and see what happens, right? Like, because uh, you know, before say I started uh you know teaching for money for example like a lot of people kept asking me hey you, you seem to know about this stuff can you train uh yeah. train yeah. developers on this and i was like yeah. okay yeah sure I'll, I'll do it as part of my job and you know, they kept doing it so i was like okay if if they like it that much then this is something that i ought to be doing um yeah, yeah. and you know you you get sort of like almost like a spidey sense of where people need things and and things like that. And you, you pick up on sort of market signals If people keep asking you to do the same stuff. It's probably because they think you're good at it and you can provide value to them. And it's, it's like so much more satisfying than doing like bureaucratic work that doesn't mean anything to anybody, like writing a report that like maybe one person reads like and then the rest of the time, it's like, <laughs> like all that time you spent on it, it's, it's just kind of wasted. Instead, it's like, you're actually providing value there there's like satisfaction yeah. in doing that right where you actually 
make somebody's life easier, better, or uh, you know, more rewarding or something uh, as a result of whatever it is you provide for them. That that's you know, like part of loving fellow human beings. That's yeah. uh, that that's part of your gift to the world, um, in, in a sense. And free markets are an amazing place to go discover those because it's everywhere. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, most people sort of like get stuck in this lie that you need to like have this like fixed path, right? Where, I don't know, maybe you're like a postdoc with a PhD looking for a tenure position or something, some, some ridiculous like that, where it's all very rent It's uh, It's very much sort of like a path that someone else designed for you. And uh, it's not necessarily to your benefit or to the world's benefit. It just happens to be what ha- uh, what's good for the system that sort of perpetuates it. So, right. um, yeah, I, I think that that's a large part of what I've um, sort of learned from Bitcoin, I guess, is it's the power of the free market and how satisfied it is just naturally. It's just that, you know, like so many people suffer from depression and like, just outright despair because they're in red seeking jobs and like, who can blame you? You're doing something that taxes a transaction without adding, adding any value. Of course, you're going to become depressed. You're, you know, you're, you're kind of a leech on society and, you know, like whether, you know, you uh, sort of admit it or not deep down inside, you know, and of course you're going to get depressed or you're going to like drown out your sorrows playing video games or drinking alcohol or something. Like that, that's such a common thing today where it's just sort of like a given. I, I know like billionaires that are doing like, you know, like uh, you know, uh, mind drugs or whatever, like, uh, you know, every day because that, that like they can't, they realize, I think some part of themselves realizes that they're not adding value to anybody, that they're yes. all just sort of like yes. playing make-believe and like, uh, you know, benefiting from, money printing in one way or the other. So, so for me, that, that I think is, uh, is a much more honest way to live and a much more satisfying way to live. And I don't know, it, it's, it's a lot easier, I think, mentally. That's uh, interesting. Uh, most of my work has been done, you know, working for clients through a company, yes, but working for clients directly. And, and I, I like serving people, you know, I, I like adding value to them, but Continuing that conversation a little bit, I've been working with or communicating with a, a guy in Zambia, two guys actually that I've gotten to know, and they've told me that in their town, they're, they're struggling, you know, economy wise. And mm-hmm. I've been getting them into Bitcoin and, and I'm working on introducing them to this idea of, of providing value and services directly online and getting paid in Bitcoin. And I'm hoping that they can uh, pick that up. And, and really, over the long run, um, yeah, build something and change their communities, their small community by that way of thinking. One of them mentioned early on that they were waiting for the government to do something. And, you know, that's a mentality that's not going to get them <laughs> anywhere. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, and there, there is sort of like this dependence on... Uh, you know, like a, a nanny state where we're not used to being free. Right. And, and this is the thing about freedom that a lot of people, I don't think get, which is freedom comes with a corresponding amount of responsibility. When, whenever you have freedom, um, you have that freedom because you also have the responsibility to take care of uh, yourself. Uh, that what a lot of people think freedom means is freedom without any responsibility, which is just being a child. They, they want to be children for the rest of their lives. What freedom actually means is freedom with corresponding amounts of responsibility where you you have to take care of your own stuff. Yeah. Thing is, uh, the the more you want other people to take care of your stuff, the less freedom you're going to have. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of the situation that a lot of people find themselves in, which is, hey, like, uh, you know, all, all these people are, um, you know, I, 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 I don't have to worry about unemployment or healthcare or this other stuff because it's sort of taken care of for me through my employer, my government, or something else. Uh, but that that also means that you have a reduction in freedom. And not necessarily like you specifically, but as a whole, definitely. Because once you make healthcare a right, for example, 
um, that just means that you're enslaving doctors and nurses uh, into providing something uh, on your behalf, whether they want to or not. Um, and, you know, like there, there are lots of things like that, especially in the monetary system uh, where, you know, like in the name of safety, they've taken away your freedom. Um, and that's, uh, that's the unfortunate sort of trade off that a lot of people are willing to make or they are willing to go along with. They, they haven't necessarily made it because they're so used to it. Uh, but I, I mean, I think there's a lot of, you know, sort of human potential that is completely locked up by mm -hmm. the fact that they're lacking this freedom. Um, but, you know, freedom, again, means that you also have to be responsible. Otherwise, yeah. your life's just going to end up a mess. So, yeah. um, you know, but, you know, the good news is that a, a lot of freedom, you just, you know, like as you experience it, you learn that responsibility, whether it's the easy way or the hard way, uh, you learn it eventually, um, because otherwise you can't survive. So uh, that life sort of has this uh, sort of, uh, you know, this function of forcing you to become more responsible, um, otherwise just sort of perishing. And it's, it's kind of uh, harsh like that. But it's also very good in the sense that you do learn responsibility and, and things as you um, you know, go through life and, and and learn a lot of this stuff. Yeah, thank you. Uh, one way I put it sometimes is to say, we seem to find ourselves in a world where where our life is is real and has real consequences. Our our choices and our actions have actual real consequences. Um, that is another way to 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 talk about responsibility and and and, and freedom. Uh, well said. Uh, okay, let's move on a little bit closer to our topic here. Uh, let me put it this way: with with Bitcoin for the first time in history, really, we we have an asset with with fixed supply. You know, even with mm. gold, you have one to two percent being added to the amount of gold in the world annually. And uh, not so with Bitcoin; it is exponentially approaching. Uh, in, you know, exponentially, the inflation of Bitcoin is approaching uh, zero. Mm -hmm. And this fixed supply of Bitcoin really sounds a lot like an absolute truth, something that mm -hmm. is always valid, valid regardless of uh, parameters or, or contexts. That is one way of describing absolute truth. So do you believe or... Yeah, do you hold that absolute truth exists and has Bitcoin in, in any way kind of shaped your conclusion on that and your thoughts on, on, on the implication of that? Yeah, at the risk of uh, digressing just a little bit, I, I, I've always sort of believed in some form of absolute truth. I, I, I was a math major, for example, mm. and, you know, like, there are certain axioms. If you uh, uh, you know take them, then you can derive certain mathematical proofs, and those are rigorous mathematical proofs that you can use to prove one thing or another. That that's an absolute truth, right? Like uh, two plus two equals four. You can prove that as long as it's like base four or higher. That that's a pretty obvious conclusion that you can you can come to. Through uh, through mathematical logic, uh, and and that's uh, you know those things exist. the The real question you're asking, I think, has to do more with uh, sort of this uh, like materialist view that is very prominent in the world. Um, and by that, I mean uh, you know that there's there's a sense in which uh, you know science is about just sort of like things that exist in the world, right? Physical processes, things, things that we can observe and th things of that nature. And uh, ever since I think like post-enlightenment thinkers and, and so on, there, there's been this persistent sort of like philosophy of uh, what, what you call like materialism. There, there is only material reality and that's it. And this is uh, a view sort of espoused by a lot of atheists, which is, you know, there's just the universe and that's it. Everything else is, you know, like sort of like a byproduct or an illusion or something like that. Um, and I would completely disagree because there's a lot of things that are not part of 
the realm of physical reality that I think we know to not uh, to actually exist. So, you know, Descartes, uh, you know, famously said, I think, therefore I am. What a lot of people don't know is that Descartes was a very strong Christian and he was trying to make the argument that there is, in addition to physical stuff, there is this other metaphysical world, right? And you can prove that that exists because we have this process called thinking. Mm -hmm. um, and that is not part of the material universe. A thought is not matter, right? It's, it, it's, it's something else. Um, and, and, you know, th this is what you would call sort of like metaphysical knowledge. And much like, uh, you know, mathematics and a lot of other things, you, you start with sort of like certain basic givens or axioms, things that are obvious and self-evidently true. Um, the fact that we think, for example, um, you know, mathematics starts with, you know, there exists an empty set and things like that. You can start with like set theory uh, stuff. Geometry starts with Triangle has three sides, and um, you know, uh, if you add any two sides, it's longer than the third side. Stuff like that. Uh, there, there, there are lots of uh, you know axioms that are self-evidently true that we call sort of a priori knowledge, um, and th this is where you can sort of derive truth, um, and that's the realm of philosophy. Uh, in a sense, like post enlightenment, uh, sort of uh, post modern uh, thinkers more or less reject that part while still kind of using that to prove, you know, what, that it doesn't exist. They're sort of like sawing off the branch the that they're standing they on, yeah. right? You know, like they're, they're just sort of like, hey, th this stuff doesn't exist and we're going to prove it by using the stuff that doesn't exist, right? Like it, it, it's just kind of a ridiculous statement. But that that that's the sort of like classically the, it, that that was how you would prove all sorts of things. You know, you read Plato, Aristotle, Aquinas, any anybody like just anybody before 150 years ago. And it was like self-evidently true that there exists stuff outside of material reality. And it's only within like the last 150 years or so that that's been rejected in favor of there's only material reality and everything else is sort of an illusion, um, which doesn't make any sense because then you can't argue or anything, right? Like your argument for that uh, sort of worldview doesn't make any coherent sense because the argument itself doesn't exist. It's uh, like a self-defeating you know, statement. It's, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a completely self-defeating statement. So. Uh, I, I think the only uh, only thing that makes sense or the only thing that's consistent is a universe where there are absolute truths. And, you know, Bitcoin is a part of that. And Bitcoin is very interesting because it takes money to this sort of metaphysical realm. Um, you know, money uh, is a little bit confusing because it, it it's a transfer of value, but it's rep or at least previously it was represented in a physical thing. So. Gold, for example, was used for money as a long time. It's actually not that useful as a metal. I mean, we found some industrial uses for it because it doesn't corrode and things like that. So people have used it for fake teeth. Um, you know, it it has a uh, it conducts uh, electricity really well. So there's like aircraft machinery that uses it and so on. We found uses, just like we found uses for all sorts of things that we previously thought were useless. Uh, but but gold, it was sort of like a, a representation of something metaphysical, which was labor you put in before or value you provided to somebody else. Um, and and, you know, the, the metal itself sort of right, like represented that. And, you know, stealing that metal was literally stealing the labor that somebody else you know put into that thing or the value that somebody else uh, provided. So um, in a sense, like Bitcoin has fully brought money to this metaphysical realm uh, because a hash is a metaphysical thing, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's a proof of work is a metaphysical thing. It, it just turns out that electricity and computation allow you to sort of access that in a physical way through energy. Um, mm -hmm. But but that that in itself is, uh, is an indicator of the, uh, there existing a metaphysic and which, you know, a lot of materialists sort of like completely deny. So mm -hmm. I, in that sense, it, it's uh, one of those uh, few things that sort of like span both realms. I would say hum humans are somebody, uh, are people, uh, people span both the physical and metaphysical. We have physical bodies, but we have metaphysical thoughts 
uh, we were able to think about abstract things and stuff like that. Um, you know, and you know, like Bitcoin itself sort of has that metaphysical quality too, because you have all these like mining machines that are constantly looking for uh, the, these, uh, you know, nonces that will get you the proof of work or whatever. And, mm -hmm. you know, that in turn creates this like data, which is metaphysical that yeah. gets stored on computers and so on that can be verified, at least in principle, just purely through thought, right? Like, mm -hmm. um, you know, it turns out that computers are much better at it than humans are, but, but at least in principle, I can like compute a SHA-256 of a particular hash using, uh, you know, using the rules of mathematics, and that's it. Um, so it, it, it spans those two realms. And in that sense, I think it, it points to this metaphysical reality in sort of like a, a very absolute way. You, you cannot deny it. And as a result of that, um, and we really didn't think this was possible before like 2009, we have absolute scarcity in the digital realm. We didn't even know if scarcity was possible in the digital realm um, or really what I would call the metaphysical realm, but there is scarcity in the metaphysical realm. It's it's kind of crazy, but it it, it actually does. And it's, uh, it's very clever and it's using a distributed ledger to do it and having everyone have a copy of it so they can verify it themselves and so on. But, but there is a way to have absolute scarcity in the digital realm and it requires a lot of other people sort of verifying it themselves. Um, really, their computers like doing the metaphysical verification. So, um, you know, there, in that sense, there, there's it, it points to an absolute truth in that there, there is something beyond the physical realm that's also true. And th this is something like philosophically that that we've been going away from. Um, I think the way Jacques Ellul put it is. Um, is uh you know he he divides uh like reality he he talks about reality and truth and reality is a subset of truth right reality is stuff you can touch um you know things that you can see you you can observe but truth is greater than that and what moderns have done is reduce truth to just reality and that's it right like that that's all that exists um but truth is greater than that and i think bitcoin definitely proves that truth is greater than just reality because mm. There exists something other than something that you can physically touch that exists, that you can definitely say exists and is there, um, and you can prove it's there, but you can't just explain it with physical processes. And that, um, you know, I think human thought is like that. The human soul is like that. Lots of, lots of things are like that. It's just, uh, you know, moderns have this, um, this conceit that they, they think they know way better uh, about philosophy than ancients, when in fact, ancients were a lot more, I think, persuasive and rigorous in their uh, approach to metaphysics or what we call philosophy. Very interesting. Uh, I'm reading a book now by a friend of mine. His name is Dr. Michael Gillen. And mm -hmm. one of his favorite phrases is, uh, truth is bigger than proof. Mm. And I think he's really talking about the same thing, where there are truths that you cannot prove with a, like, you know, the, you know, two plus two equals four, like you mentioned, you can prove that mm -hmm. with math. It's mm -hmm. like an ironclad proof. But then there are other truths that are real and mm -hmm. very useful, and you really need them if you're going to benefit explore in a given area, uh, but you may not be able to prove these truths like you prove two plus two equals four. Um, mm -hmm. So I yeah, think and, and who has the time, right? Like, uh, and this is something <laughs> that, uh, that Aquinas pointed out in his, uh, his work, the uh, um, Summa Theologica is, you know, uh, you know that that whole work is a logical masterpiece, right? It, it starts with one statement, another statement, and it just sort of like builds and it steel mans every argument and says, okay, here's here's uh, here's how you could derive that God exists, for example, and here here's the argument for it, and here's the best argument on the other side that he could come up with. He's steel manning the argument and he disproves each one, right? Like, and he goes through step by step logically proving every single thing but he's like you know who's who has time for that right like i i'm a monk 
I, I, you know, I've been studying this stuff for years and I'm writing it all down because, you know, I think it's, uh, you know, good for posterity, but it's entirely possible that a lot of people don't have time for that or even the logical faculties to derive all of this truth. And his argument was, well, then, you know, like for most people, it's going to have to be what he, he would call revealed truth or revelation, right? Not necessarily derived from proof or like logically derived step by step. It's there and it's it, you can go look for it if you want to. And, uh, and you know, any, anything that's true, I think you should be able to prove. Uh, but, you know, you, you might not necessarily have time for it or know the path to get to that proof. And oftentimes, uh, revelation is a lot easier um, and a lot more effective, and you you get to the same truths anyway. And that's uh, you know, I, and that's his point why you need something like the Bible because you get revealed truth. And there there is a category of sort of revealed truth that he talks about that's outside uh, of the realm of being able to prove it with human logic, either because we don't have enough, uh, well, we, we haven't gotten that deep, right? There are mathematical truths that, that we're pretty sure are true and provable. It's just that we haven't done it, right? Yeah. Like gold box conjecture and lots, yeah. of, th lots of other things. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, there might also be a category of, uh, of truth that's uh, just sort of beyond our comprehension or beyond the ability of our uh, sort of logical faculties yeah. to actually grasp it or even understand what it means. Like, I, I, I don't think anybody understands what it means to be outside of time, for example, what, mm -hmm. what, what does mm -hmm. like, it, like there, there's, it just does, it, it's not something that our minds can even comprehend really, mm -hmm. um, you know, despite science fiction uh, mm -hmm. writers trying to the contrary, but that, um, you know, there, there is a, uh, an absolute truth. Um, and I, I don't think there's any denying that when, when you look at any sort of like metaphysic uh, that, that, you know, you know, and, and you're not a complete materialist or, you know, thinking that, you know, this universe is all there is, and there's nothing outside of it, uh, like thought or concepts or mathematics, or, you know, like the ideal gas law and things like that. Yeah. We're going to open it up for questions here later on in a bit. Some of those joining us on the Zoom call may have a different take on this, and uh, and we love to talk about that. Um, these uh, these conversations about uh, metaphysical truths, uh, like you you mm -hmm. said earlier, that's one of the things that has really surprised me as I've been studying Bitcoin. This this way of Bitcoin bridging, really, the physical and the, and the metaphysical. Mm. And uh, when you think about it, the, the, the qualities of Bitcoin are not that many. It is mm -hmm. really simple in a way. Mm. And it has really surprised me how cascading and how huge the implication is of implementing those few qualities. Um, for me, that points to the way I put it is that, you know, we, we all have these ideas about the world we live in, you know, we are all in the same world. So whatever our world view, worldview is, we have some ideas about it, you know, and, that, and the better the ideas represent reality as it is, the better they will serve us, you know, hmm. if, if I believe the door on my house is on, on the right, but it actually is on the left. I will hurt myself if I run, try to run through it. You know, if my idea mm -hmm. about the world is wrong, I will hurt myself and others. And mm -hmm. I, I think Bitcoin is one of those examples where it is implementing something that really is re representing the world as it really is. And once you once you lock in on that, you you get you get the benefits because it works mm -hmm. with reality the, the way it is. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if. It's just a little little rant from me here. I don't know if you want to comment you, on that. That, 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 that. That's correct. And um, and the thing is, I don't. I, Bitcoin is kind of simple in the sense that it's it's um, it makes sort of like a very ideal money. It has fungibility, divisibility, you know, portability, and all this other stuff that that are ideal properties of money. Uh, but the thing that Bitcoin points us towards is 
money itself and what is money and this is the question that a lot of people don't answer and it's purposefully not taught to us but if you think about money like really think about money it is a very deep thing um it it, it and it encompasses so much because it is largely about relationships and relationships mm. are again a metaphysical thing right like as physical bodies right like uh you know uh, i have children that i guess share my dna and stuff like that but there's a relationship with my child right like there there's uh you know father child relationship between me and my children that's not just physical it's not just the fact that they have my dna it's I'm taking care of them. I'm feeding them. I'm doing, um, you know, I'm, I'm emotionally supporting them. I'm helping to see them, uh, help them see truth and so on. Um, and relationships, uh, you know, are, you know, like have this sort of like uh, way of measuring something about it with money because mm -hmm. it's value you provided to somebody, usually like a stranger or somebody, but it, it, money represents something. And it's a big part of relationships and it's it's sort of like a you know other than like emotional things and things like that it 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 represents value that you can sort of transfer whether for goods or services or because you love the other person or because you want to bribe the other person you know there there are all sorts of ways in which uh relationships have this like if you if you see like people as nodes on on sort of like a metaphysical network and and like lines between them as the relationship itself it money is able to cross between nodes you know kind of like the lightning network right uh, and you're 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 able to sort of like transfer value in, in some way so it really points to uh you know a deeper reality of what human what it means to be human what it means to mm -hmm. be part of a society what it means to be part of a civilization mm -hmm. so it's not surprising at all that it really puts into question the deep structure of humanity and civilization itself, because there is something very true um, that that we're tapping into. Um, and there is a sense in which, OK, like something was wrong with the current monetary system where, you know, there's a giant node in the middle. We'll call it the Federal Reserve that can like, uh, you know, like push out value without providing any value in return to anybody, right? Like that's essentially what they're able to do. Uh, and and that, uh, that sort of like messes up every other relationship. The entire network gets corrupted by that one uh, sort of node, uh, you know, like sort of privileging all the nodes that are connected to it and so on. So, um, you know, I, I think at a deep level, we recognize that this is completely unfair and that it affects everything it affects relationships and so on and having a fairer system just sort of like points us towards okay this is how it's supposed to work like there there's something like like i said like when i when i went into the free market okay th this is so much more satisfying because i'm actually providing value and they're paying me right like mm -hmm. i am giving them something that they want and they are giving me money which i can use to go get what i want mm -hmm. um and now like now I feel a little guilty now whenever I get something for free because I'm like, well, I didn't provide any value, right? Like, uh, and I, I actually want to pay for stuff because they're, if somebody is providing me value, I want to make sure that they're getting value in return. Um, and there, there, there's something like um, sort of like uh, almost sacred about a market transaction because you you have sort of like obligations towards one another they're they're the link between the two nodes becomes very strong instead of unidirectional where which is what you get when you get things for free um and that again is at like sort of like a metaphysical structure of civilization if you will it's a it's mm -hmm. it's the relationship graph that we have um and each uh each link between uh each edge between the nodes uh, it, you know, like determines the strength of the entire network. And, uh, you know, like to use the lightning network analogy, uh, you know, the channel capacities are too, too, uh, too small, or uh, they only go in one direction or something like that, then it's, it's not going to be a very robust network. But if you're constantly like sort of providing value and having more sort of relationships, 
Yeah, it's it's actually a very good metaphor for how civilization gets built, how societies form, and how you sort of like build up um, sort of like almost metaphysical capital, right? Like um, this is a concept that I learned from Raheem when I had him on my podcast is, you know, like trust is a form of capital. Like it takes mm-hmm. a long time yep. for people to build up yeah. trust. Yeah. And if you if you have a high trust society, you could build things up really quickly. Uh, whereas if you have a low trust society, you know, it's very, very difficult. And he explains, okay, this is why in Europe and Asia post-World War II, you had these economies spring up very, very quickly because you had high trust society. Whereas, you know, in places like Africa and the Middle East, where there's a, like constant war and they're low trust societies, it's very hard to build it. And it, really what that's talking about is this relationship graph with very weak edges, right? Because people don't trust each other. These are not very strong edges. And as a result, you don't, you don't, you can't build it up. So in a sense, in order to build up civilization, you really have to go to that sort of metaphysical relationship realm and make sure that that's strong. And unfortunately, that's weakening everywhere. As he, uh, as Raheem pointed out on my podcast, you know, trust is being weakened everywhere. And the thing is, once you lose trust, it's very difficult to build it back up again. Um, there are still people in Russia that are still incredibly traumatized by communism, yeah. which essentially spent down all of the trust of its people by like sending them to gulags and everything else. Uh, so, you know, there, there's a cost to like sort of drawing on this sort of metaphysical value that that exists, uh, the, this capital that uh, that's been drawn. Uh, which brings me to another thought there, uh, you know, a lot of this is what we would call economics, uh, mm-hmm. you know, the, the, this, uh, um, this dynamic and money and uh, the structure of civilization and so on. Um, and, uh, and this was something that I was talking to Robert Breedlove about, uh, you know, the Keynesian paradigm is very materialist. It, it just completely denies a metaphysical reality. It treats human beings as automatons, more or less, homo economicus, right? Like that behaves a certain way based on whatever. Um, and, and that's a completely inaccurate way to measure the world. And, uh, you know, it, it makes for completely horrible predictions and it justifies all sorts of tyranny because uh, if people are automatons, then you can just collect data and make the best decisions based on that data. Mm-hmm. Um, but of course, we're not automatons. We have free will. We we can do what we want. We have different dreams. We have different preferences. Um, and that's, uh, that's what I find really uh, attractive about uh, Austrian economics. It, it takes metaphysical truth into account. It's what, uh, what Hans Hermann Hoppe calls like a priori knowledge, right? Like it's not knowledge gained through observation, empiricism, but it's knowledge gained through thinking, through metaphysics, through, uh, through philosophy. Um, and that, that in turn makes much better predictions, right? Like you, you, uh, like, you know, they, uh, Austrian economics has its own set of axioms. People prefer thing if it's a good, then they want it sooner rather than later. Um, they would rather, you know, have more of it than less of it. So mm-hmm. stuff like that. Like those are the basic axioms of Austrian economics that you use to derive lots of other things. Um, and that metaphysical aspect uh, looks like it's extremely important for anything that involves humans, uh, any sociological, psychological thing. Uh, if it's like a physical process, like physics or chemistry or biology or something like that, um, you can you can stay in the observation realm uh, and use the metaphysical realm to derive certain laws and so, stuff like that. But for anything that involves humans w- who have a connection to the metaphysical, you you really kind of need to bring in the metaphysical in order to have an explanation that makes sense about uh, about that field. And that that's I, I, I think uh, I, how I would defend Austrian economics uh, versus, you know, the ridiculousness that is Keynesian. Mm-hmm. This is really, really interesting. Uh, it brings brings me to something that I've been thinking about that I, I want to ask you about, uh, which is related to. Well, let, let let me give you the backstory. So, so in the U.S. now, and you correct me if you disagree with me. What we're seeing is that we have companies that actually are taking more than they are providing. They are operating mm. under the zero. 
So they're mm-hmm. able to continue operating because their access to cheap loans is so mm-hmm. easy that they just refinance and they keep going. Mm-hmm. So in a way, if that continues and, and just that development is kind of like going into communism through the back door. You know, <laughs> yeah. because the, the, the heart of the capitalist system is that companies that are not working should be removed and new, mm-hmm. more efficient companies should should arise. OK, mm-hmm. so we, we have that going on. And then we have obviously the reality that most people agree that communism really didn't work. And one way to describe why it didn't work is that you have to centrally plan everything. And it is so complex. There are so many variables that it is completely beyond us humans to to really plan all of that besides other Mm. problems that that i'm not going to go into now i don't know where i saw this but someone brought up the idea that potentially with artificial intelligence you could potentially uh you know keep track of all those variables and potentially see a communism system work and having AI plan everything. It's, it's a really interesting idea. And then in my mm-hmm. mind, I go, all right, is it possible that actually the technology of Bitcoin may be our best protection against a centrally you know, centrally planned AI system? Mm-hmm. Does this pro, you know, prompt any thoughts for you? Yeah, well, so I, I don't think centrally central planning just I, I, I don't think it works. It doesn't matter how intelligent an AI you have. Right, right. Uh, the thing is, like what what AI does is it takes previous data and, you know, runs a simulation against, uh, you know, like uh, other data. Right. Like it, it takes everything but the data that it's going to test against and then. Uh, it tests against that data and see how well it performs. That's more or less how AI works is you uh, you keep tweaking the algorithm until you get something that's uh, you know reasonably accurate or whatever. But these are all based on probabilities. It, it will never uh, sort of predict like new fashion trends, for example. Right, uh, that, right. that's that's a right. very creative endeavor and it it comes out of sort of this metaphysical realm where like anything creative comes out of the metaphysical realm like thinking of a song or something like that it's uh you know it, it's it, it's it's a brand new thing it's it's something that comes out of you know sort of like this concept of music and lyrics and all this other stuff and combining it in this unique way to produce something that people may or may not like uh, and and people's preferences change what uh you know like Obviously, what was trendy 100 years ago is not that trendy now and, and so on. So I, I don't think there's any central planning that will ever really work uh, for more than a few people, um, largely because people are different. And we, we have this metaphysical connection. And that, that means that we are not uh, automatons. You know, like uh, what, what Christians would say is that there's a breath of life in us. And that means that we have this connection to the eternal, the metaphysical, the spiritual, if you will. Um, and it's uh, it, it means that, you know, like it's not easily predictable. And it, it, in fact, it's, it's extremely hard to predict because we have free will. We, we have the ability to do things uh, that are completely against what the system thinks that we're going to want. Um, and some, for some people, it's because it's what the system wants you to want. So, um, you know, they're, they, they're, they're just sort of like contrarian by nature. So I, I, I don't think that can ever really work. And again, I think uh, that sort of conceit comes from a materialist worldview, thinking that humans are just machines and that they're deterministic and that they, they have no sort of free will of their own and that, uh, you know, given uh, uh, certain variables that they will always act a particular way or 90% of them will attack, uh, will do something a particular way. Um, and that that's simply not predictable. It's it, like so much of it depends on all sorts of variables that are completely like not under the control, much of it sort of metaphysical, much of it um, you know, like not within the realm of control of any, uh, anyone really. Um, so, so yeah, uh, I, I like, yeah, it, it annoys me that so many people think that way that like, uh, you know, everything is 
just sort of materialist uh, materialist that in that in the sense that we're just a you know bag of flesh and bones and things like that and uh, you know we we do exactly what our appetites tell us and that's it um, that's not how people are they they you know actually have discipline they don't eat all day because food tastes good uh, they they I mean some people do but not not everyone. Um, you don't just gamble all day because it's fun. You know, some people do, but not everyone there there's, you know, the, it's not just incentives or, uh, you know, people are not automatons as much as corporate masters would like us to be. Um, that's essentially what they're trying to turn us into with all sorts of advertising and things like that. But, but that, uh, you know, there, there is sort of this human spirit that's fiercely independent. And I don't think that goes away anytime soon um, as much as they've tried I don't think it goes away. I think this question of, of what it is to be human, and then mm -hmm. I think what you said earlier, really paraphrasing it was, you were saying that the Keynesian economics is misunderstanding or and even mistreating humanity, mistreating what mm -hmm. it is to be human. And that with something like Bitcoin, you are really restoring uh, the ability for humans to interact through this medium of money uh, mm -hmm. in such a way that, yeah, freedom, um, you know, the ability to own something, etc., is seems to be really linked with what it what it is really to be a human and not as opposed to being a robot, like you were referring to earlier. Um, yeah, and the Keynesians like to treat humans as robots because it makes policy making much easier and it justifies yeah. their ability to make such decisions. Because if humans are robots, then whoever has the most data can make the most uh, the best decisions, right? Like, and being the central gatherer of data, uh, you know, even useless data like GDP and unemployment numbers, which are all cooked anyway. Um, you know, they they. They, they at least have uh, the moral authority under that framework to say, okay, now, now we're going to do this stimulus or we're going to make this program or we're going to take these rights away from you. And it's, uh, it's completely justified in their view because they live in a materialist uh, sort of framework where like, you know, material, material world is all there is. And, you know, human will doesn't matter. Um, whereas the Austrian view is much more that each individual has their own desires and, you know, they will tend to act one way or the other, but, you know, you can't just treat them all the same, right? They, they have different preferences. There's a price at which I will buy a car that's not the same as the price at which you will buy the car. I, it might be the same, but it's definitely not all the same throughout an entire economy. Um, and that, that sort of thing is very, uh, it, it's an important part of like treating, um, you know, anything with humans in it. There, there does tend to be an arrogance uh, in academia, especially uh, uh, in that regard, where if you just sort of like dismiss this metaphysical slash spiritual dimension, you end up turning everyone into robots. <laughs> you, you, yeah. you end up... Yeah. Uh, sort of like dehumanizing them and yeah. end up, you know, like in an extreme way, uh, what in the extreme case, like sending them to gulags and concentration mm -hmm. camps and, yeah. and things like that, because, well, they're, they're, they're robots, they're, they're not really human, or they're, they're, you know, um, going against what we're trying to do. And, you know, therefore, you know, like, we can, we can sacrifice them. And it, it's very closely tied, I think, with morality, because, in a materialist conception of the world, you know, it, there, like, what morality can you have? There's no just morality itself is a metaphysic, right? It's it's right. It, it's something derived from, uh, you know, it's it's a code of rules essentially for behavior, and it doesn't make any sense in a materialist world. Like, you have no uh, no justification for not lying, for example, and not stealing or whatever. Uh, whereas in uh, in a, you know, in an ethic that allows for metaphysics and, you know, uh, a realm outside of the material world, you do have morals. And at that point, it's okay, well, you know, we actually have rights, uh, you know, each individual has dignity, and they are allowed to speak, 
and own property and you can't just take it away from them and you can't imprison them without a really good reason right or if they hurt somebody yeah then then maybe they should go go into prison or whatever but you can't just take away their rights there has to be justification but in a materialist worldview you very quickly descend into well we can justify anything because uh this vision that we have of the world we want that's enough and that that's where we want to go and whoever stands in our way is evil and therefore we can go destroy them because they're they don't have rights there are no there there's no ethical problem with doing that i um, mean this is where we get sort of like the tragedies of history and tragedies currently going on in places like north korea and myanmar and many other places so um in a sense like uh, the worldview espoused by keynesians is really dangerous <laughs> it, it it's it's literally decivilizing dehumanizing and yeah. destructive uh yes. like it, it's it's really yeah. like really horrible yeah. and of course monetary policy is just one tool of that whole thing uh -huh. but you know like it, it 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 corrupts the entire network of human relationships uh through money printing um that you know I, I i think i described earlier but and you know in doing so it corrupts everything else and sort of like drags down civilization along with it very good um as a side note i was having a little bit of a conversation with a icelander on twitter who is uh, part of the central bank uh, board of the central mm -hmm. bank here in iceland and uh, a couple of friends of mine here in iceland who have a bitcoin podcast were inviting him to join uh, their podcast and he said i will only join if you will read these like four or five books and write a 1000 you know word essay for each book uh so it, the attitude seems to be this is too complex for you to understand and it's pointless for me to engage in the conversation um mm. so, so you're hearing that from one side but from the other side you're thinking on the fundamental common sense, you know, thinking of printing money out of nothing and uh, some of the things you are speaking, it's hard to see this idea of the Keynesian economics really work. And then you got the history of implementing it since, I don't know what, World War One or so. And the fruits of that are devastating. You know, in my life, mm. before, the year before I was born here in Iceland in 1974, we had 40% inflation. When I was around 10 years old, the inflation went above 70%. You know, and then in 08, our three biggest banks went, you know, across the cliff. So those are the realities, the, the results of running on these models. Hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, so I, I would say that economics is just one of the more, obvious consequences of this worldview but the worldview has been there for like the last 150 years i think uh since marx and nietzsche uh you know two very atheist and very sort of like materialist uh like they, they have materialist conceptions of the world and nietzsche sort of like came up with this like almost psychopathic morality right like where it's will to power it's Whatever I want to do, I will do, and that's justified. Uh, there, there, like it, it's that sort of ethic that took hold, and that that's I think where it leads when you when you have a materialist conception of the world. It's and you know economics is just one aspect, mm -hmm. uh, but the world's been going this way for a while now, and uh, you know it's sort of like accepted as real by almost everybody in the elite you know, anything, right? Like uh, in the media, certainly in academia, um, in Hollywood, in uh, pr pretty much anyone with any sort of like authority, um, even if they don't necessarily believe it, like has to have that frame of mind in order to convince other people. Yeah. Um, and it, it has to have like, you know, the, the concrete material benefits, uh, you know are are always like you know espoused uh instead of abstract things like natural rights <laughs> where you know those things oh you know like 
it's fine to lock up people for 18 months as long as we're, you know, saving people's lives, right? Like mm-hmm. what, what, what's one thing to the other? Um, and it, it, it's, uh, it's a morally bankrupt equation because it comes from an entirely materialist worldview. It's, okay, well, these are the lives and lives uh, we are going to judge as infinitely more important than anything else. Uh, and even lives that are lost uh, as a result of implementing this policy. Um, you know, like it, uh, it, a non-materialist worldview quickly becomes discombobulated yeah. uh, because there's no sort of like standard by which you can actually reasonably judge anything. And you get uh, sort of like the ridiculous sort of arguments that you get now, um, you know, with respect to a lot of different things. Um, and, you know, at heart is this sort of trend from 150 years ago, where essentially you, uh, you know, you have Marx and Nietzsche, like espousing sort of like very atheist materialist beliefs uh, that have more or less gone mainstream. Yeah. yeah. All right. Let's uh, open it up for questions. I bet uh, you guys uh, joining us on the Zoom call here have some questions. Uh, Good questions, uh, pushback, uh, perspective. Uh, let me see if I can unmute you. If you raise your hand or just text me, I can unmute you. Uh, or if you can unmute yourself. Uh, I have more questions if you don't have them. So plenty of things to talk about. But uh, the floor is free if anyone has a question. OK, Stephen, go for it. Let me see if I can. Uh, hey, uh, how, how's my mic coming through? Is my audio all right? Absolutely all fantastic. Right. Good. Hey. All right. Yeah. yeah great thank to see you. you again. Thanks for joining. Yeah, of course. Yeah. No, this is a great way to to reconnect and and meet. I, for those who aren't uh, aware, I, I originally met August in Iceland. I, I had the privilege of visiting during an academic trip. So uh, yeah, this is actually, I guess, the first time face to face again since since a few months ago. So that's great. Um, yeah. And thanks so much for speaking as well, Jimmy. Um, yeah. My question for you is kind of brief. I'm just wondering if you think in a universe with no people, is it possible to have monetary value? No, I don't think so. <laughs> like, I, well, like you, you need something metaphysical to make that work. And Money is really like it, it only makes sense in a network of relationships. If you don't have a network of relationships, then like what is money, right? Like, uh, you know, all these like post apocalyptic like worlds, they, they always have trouble with money, right? Like, whenever science fiction tries to make it, it's like, well, okay, like money kind of becomes useless because everyone just takes it and it's like, okay, like there's a billion dollars sitting in this bank and like no one takes it anymore, right? Like, you need something actually scarce. Uh, because a lot of the nodes in a uh, in that graph of relationships kind of go down, and like what was passing through as value doesn't work anymore because there's no enforcer, um, especially with uh, you know, I, unless the U.S. government still exists. At, at which point, you know that that might make sense. But if if you don't have uh, like an enforcer, you need decentralized money, and that's uh, you know like traditionally what it was before sort of governments took over and took over that responsibility and like sort of co-opted it for themselves. And this is why we say that like every relationship is corrupted by money to some degree. Um, But without nodes, then, you know, the value transfer doesn't make any sense. Um, I suppose if there were aliens or something like that, then maybe that, and they had relationships uh, which had some metaphysical component then uh, some sort of money might make sense. But in a world without people, there's no value to anything because there's no one to value it, right? Like, like gold isn't worth anything because no one's doing anything with it. Uh, oil isn't worth anything because no one's doing anything with it. And land isn't worth anything because no one's doing anything with it. Not, not, nothing's worth anything because no one is able to put it to productive use. And usually productive use is for the benefit of other people. It's all dependent on people existing. Uh so in that sense, like it's a money is strange because it's a metaphysical construct that depends on the existence of human beings. Um, there is no money without human beings. Uh, and just like there are no relationships without human beings, right? Like 
you can't have a relationship between two people if there are new, no human beings existing because there wouldn't be people. Um, so, you know, I, I would say that it's something to that effect and that, uh, that you, you know, it, it's uh, like, I, I don't want to use like an Eric Weinstein term, but it's uh, money exists on the substrate of human relationships. Cool. Yeah, thanks. I, I definitely have a few more questions, but I'm not going to hog the floor. So we'll let some other people ask first. Well, if you have a follow-up question to this one, it kind of sounded like you might have a follow-up question, you know, shoot away. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Well, uh, the motivation for the question came from, and you, and you kind of worked through it in your, your, your response, is uh, uh, if, if something has metaphysical kind of value, then it seems like it could exist apart from whatever uh, mm. is in the physical, you know, you know what I mean? Or, or mm. if, uh, if the value of money... Uh, mm -hmm. can kind of exist, yeah, regardless of what happens to, to be this situation in the world. Then, but, but I guess it really makes sense with your view because to you, people aren't physical either. Uh -huh. and so, yeah, well, they're, they're both physical and metaphysical, right? Like right, it, spiritual, yeah. 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 yeah, well, I, what I would say, though, is this, this gets into kind of deep theology. Uh, it, if you're a Christian, you believe that relationships exist, even if there were no human beings, because God exists and God exists in three. And, you know, there, there's a relationship between father and son and things like that. Um, but, uh, you know, and like you would say that that is the substrate upon which the entire world is built, including the physical world, because, you know, the, it, it's it's within that uh, reality that physical reality emerges is you know, what, what we call sort of like the mind of God. Um, but, you know, uh, in, in which case, you know, like relationships exist and if relationships exist, then like value transfer exists. Um, and this is where you get sort of like the Christian concepts of like forgiveness and debt and things like that, because there's something that we owe God, right? Like there, there's something that, uh, that, that we've done to offend God and, um, and there's, uh, there's a debt to be paid that this is value that we've taken away, uh, or, owe or something to that effect. And th this is, and again, that's based on a relationship and there, there's a relationship there that's been violated and so on. Uh, so you could say that, uh, you know, depending on your beliefs, like there isn't a universe without people, but if there, uh, there wasn't a universe without people, there still would be relationships, uh, depending on your theology of metaphysical beings. <laughs> are, are you then saying what counts as a metaphysical being in a way? Yeah. Well, I, I would say God. Um, if you believe in angels and demons, I think those would be it too. Um, uh, and, you know, there, there's, yeah, I, 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 I can't even imagine what value transfer between beings like that even looks like. Uh, but mm -hmm. there, but I, I suspect that it, it's it sort of like a primary part of almost any relationship. It's uh, like money goes through this network of relationships. Um, now, in a purely spiritual dimension, like what what does that look like? I, I mean, in, in, in Christianity, there's this whole language of sin and debt and forgiveness and, rem, uh, uh, you know, remission of sins and forgiveness of sins and things like that. It's all monetary language. It's, uh, I suspect that it's there because, you know, there's value transfer happening and, um, and it's between, you know, sort of like nodes of, you know, relationships. And if you see God as like a giant node with, a uh, with a link to everybody else and having some sort of relationship and sort of their, uh, the edge representing, you know, how much debt is owed and so on and, and so forth. Um, yeah, there, there's probably something there, uh, about, you know, um, being an, uh, you know, God as an infinite being sort of being able to give, uh, like sort of in an infinite way. Um, which is strangely enough, now that I think about it, kind of what the central bank tries to do. <laughs> it's trying to take the place of God. Um, 
but uh but you know i it's a it's a cool question to think about i haven't really thought through the theology of all of that but i suspect there's something that we really have no idea about that probably has some analogies to money which is um you know like if you believe that metaphysical beings exist then and you know i i even count humans as metaphysical beings in a sense because we you know we we sort of exist in that realm as well then yeah it's possible for the world to not have physical people but they're still being relationships of money <laughs> so um i i don't i i can't even imagine what that might look like because it's uh we're so used to physical reality sort of dictating so much of what we do um but yeah those are my thoughts <laughs> Let me just throw in this, you know, one of the things we're going to talk about in a session later on is, is the whole topic of purpose. And I, I, I suggest that that is related to this because money is storing human energy and human, human time. And uh, we do that for a given purpose in mind, you know. Um, and then if, when you think about the animals, you know, they are last, lastly... Uh, their behavior is dominated by their instincts and they're kind of, they're programmed to, to behave in a certain way. Uh, and I think most of us agree, well, at least I would say they, for, for the most part, are not able to work towards like a large purpose, you know, plan strategically and, and work towards a purpose, which is more something that, that we as humans do. Um, all right, any other questions or any, any follow-up comments on that, Stephen? Uh, no, if I were to ask another question, I'd be changing the subject. And yeah, I don't want to be like a Gatling gun one after the other. So I'll <laughs> Good right. question, good question. Yeah. Anyone else? You can just unmute yourself and uh, shoot away. I just had a thought when, when he was saying earlier about the uh, money being linked to relationships, relationships being metaphysical, he likened it to the uh, nodes and the lightning network and the, you know, there's the nodes, but it somehow has to go from one node to the other node, it has to be transferred. And it just remind it was reminding me of uh, the Apostle Paul's words in verse Corinthians 12 about the church being built and being being you know what builds the church is the relationships the sinews and the ligaments between uh, are the are the relationships um and then, and when he said the fed is able to push out the value without creating value and how that screws up all other relationships i thought that was interesting that point that when something comes in and disrupts what's happening with the relationships it makes all of them kind of get off kilter and so we all have this intrinsic thing that we know something is like not right. And so he said, Bitcoin comes along and we go, oh, that's a more fair system. And I was just thinking about how, what is it in us that makes us say, this is how it should be. This is how it ought to be. Where does this, this ought, this should, you know, come from? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, there's definitely a deep sense of fairness uh, that we have um, that many people would call sort of like the conscience or, um, you know, sense of justice or something like that, that uh, a lot of people have. And, you know, like, I, I think at heart, we, we want rules to be uniform, right? like across everybody, right? Like, uh if certain people have privileges that you don't and they did nothing to deserve it then that seems unfair right like that that's that's a normal thing um now like i i, I think that's perfectly fine as long as they have additional responsibilities that go with those privileges right like if if uh if somebody is making more money than you, uh, it, but they also have a lot more responsibility, right? They're they're also like providing a lot more value, something something to that effect. Then that's just because the 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 sort of like level of uh, you know value provided and the value gained is roughly equal, and and that it, it's sort of like a balanced channel in the night lightning network, right? Like it's. You're, you're getting the exchanges are fair. Um, 
But when the exchanges are not fair, when somebody is able to not provide very much value and get a ton of money, like say an investment banker making $100 million a year doing 100x leverage and getting bailed out by the government when they inevitably fail or need repo uh, bailouts or something like that, um, that is rightly seen as deeply unfair, you know? Uh, and, you know, like, I, I, I don't know. I feel like the media picks on a little too much on like, you know, teachers that are not actually working and like sit in like those rooms or whatever. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're rent seeking too. But I think the most, much more egregious thing, the, the thing that people are much more, I ought to be much more outraged about are like members of Congress that were dirt poor coming in and are suddenly making $20 million, right? Like uh, a year uh, from various investments and privileges that they get because it's clear that they're not providing that much value, but somehow they are able to sort of rent seek off of the money printer, um, especially the budget that they get to craft uh, for their own benefit and so on. So um, all, of, all of that, I think, is pointing to, uh, you know, like our, our sense of justice is there probably because that's how uh, that that's how society is supposed to function. Now we're we're not very cognizant of that for ourselves usually, right? Like if it's like it, if we're talking about our own jobs, then we'll justify it to the ends of the earth, like that we're we're providing value or whatever. But it's very clear when we're looking at other people's, right? Like it's like okay, politicians don't add very much. These bureaucrats don't add very much. Uh, you know, those investment bankers don't add very much. Uh, you know, those HR people don't add. Like, it, there, there are all sorts of ways in which we can identify, uh, you know, those things uh, with other people. And it sort of offends our uh, sense of justice for that reason, because, you know, the, uh, we, we know what is actually beneficial to this network of relationships and what is not. And we know that ultimately, if like an edge far away from us uh, is corrupted, that it'll eventually find its way over to us, right? Like we'll, we will suffer the consequences, usually through money, right? Like, because inflation has this weird effect of affecting absolutely everybody. These, mm -hmm. these edges, it, it like spreads through a network very, very fast. Uh, whereas, you know, a lot of other things don't spread quite as fast, um, like ideologies and things like that and ideas. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think it points to sort of like, um, like what, uh, like what, what actually works, um, and whether you believe it's, uh, through divine design or through some, you know, other system that has worked in the past that we're all already used to, I, you know, there, there's something that works that we have an instinct for that is not being implemented yeah something that works that we have an instinct for that hasn't been implemented yet uh, that means that as that takes place we, we're going to see more and more changes um mm -hmm. anyone else with a question comment so i got a quick question real quick um a lot of this is new, so I, I get what you're uh, getting at. It's, it, it, it's, mm. it's the framework makes sense. I guess mm. to pursue it a little bit further, um, what, like, how, how did you get? I, I, I mean, you know, it's, it's quite a bridge to cross from theology, Bitcoin, now mm -hmm. a broader philosophy that kind of connects them both. Mm. Um, as a, as a Christian, I, I get what you're saying, mm -hmm. but, um, but at the same time, like I don't know, like how to get to what you're thinking about <laughs> because <laughs> because I now I I can certainly record you know you guys are recording mm -hmm. this I think it'll be a great video to share I think it's it's certainly worth consideration and kind of just chewing through but there's a lot of chewing but mm -hmm. I want to go a little bit further and kind mm -hmm. of say okay well how do I explore this a little bit more and so I'm curious about your journey as to how you kind of got there some of the books that were influential I, I noticed that you had you had a uh, proposed that that study in one of the rooms. Mm -hmm. Hey, I'm interested in studying this one book, but certainly 
you're farther mm-hmm. along now this journey than I, you know, I'm, I'm just beginning. I'm, I'm curious as to some books you might have, uh, you know, preferences mm-hmm. for to kind of go down that rabbit hole, if you will. Yeah, I, I would say that a lot of philosophy um, is actually really useful, not like modern stuff, but like ancient yeah, stuff, right. you know, starting, um, starting with, um, you know, people like Plato and Aristotle. It's amazing that like atheism, like as a, a worldview actually didn't really take hold until like 1850. Well, maybe around like 1790s in, uh, in, in France with, you know, the French revolution and stuff like that, 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 that was maybe the first real atheist government. Um, and of course we know how that <laughs> didn't end very well. Um, but there, there's, a you know, that like, if you go pretty much any time before that, um, you know, it, it's very like, it's very obvious that a metaphysical realm exists, right? And this is where you go from, I think, therefore I am. And that I am is not just physical. It's about the metaphysical self. I think, therefore I exist in the metaphysical realm. There exists something that is me apart from my body, right? Like that isn't just my body's processes or something because I think, and the ability to think is a metaphysical thing. Um, so you could start from there and read Descartes. Um, you know, I, I, I haven't read him personally. I've read some commentaries about him, but, uh, but there, there's um, a lot of actually like the history of science is actually the defense of Christianity, which is interesting in of itself. And uh, you know, it's been sort of like turned around to this very materialist worldview, <laughs> like sort of like rejecting a lot of it. Uh, but, you know, like, Starting with philosophy, I think, is a very good foundation because like, it, it allows you to sort of like build up, okay, what, what are sort of like the metaphysical primitives? Um, you know, what, what, what are some things that we know? Well, we know that we can think um, and, you know, you can, you can derive natural rights in that way. Um, you know, a lot of uh, Austrian economics authors actually like are atheists, uh, but somehow come out on the side of natural rights and sort of these uh, these axioms uh, to develop Austrian economics. And their justification is usually starts from, well, I have control over my own body. Therefore, uh, you know, even to make an argument uh, or to argue with somebody suggests that they are in possession of their own thoughts, their own being. Um, Therefore, like we, uh, you know, I'm going to take as an axiom that you have the right to your own thought. Therefore, you have the right to your own body. Therefore, the, exi- the right to life, ex- natural right to life exists. Therefore, the re- natural right to liberty exists and everything else. And they sort of like build up a morality that way. Um, I, I think that's a little bit of a cheat because it's sort of going around the question of, well, what's the justification for you believing that other than it's convenient to do so? Um, you know, if you're a Christian, then it's a li- little bit easier because their rights given by God and therefore it exists. That's that's it. Um, and it, it's a lot cleaner than having to justify it through sort of like experience and saying, OK, well, then any philosophy that we make after, you know, uh, if we deny the uh, right to have our own thoughts and things like that, like make no sense whatsoever, because you're more or less. uh it's a self-defeating argument, like sawing off the branch that you're standing on and so on. So I, it's, it, it's an interesting sort of way to, way to do it. Uh, but like a lot of Austrian economists, uh, economists uh, go through that Hans Hermann Ahapa and Murray Rothbard and uh, uh, Ludwig von Mises. Um, they, they all sort of have some form of that argument in their books. Mm-hmm. Um but yeah, I mean, like for me, uh, the the more important ones uh, for my learning are, uh, you know, commentaries on Aquinas. He's very difficult to read, just like straight up. Uh, you know, I would say also, um, uh, you know, I, I I like Chesterton and C.S. Lewis and um, sure, you know, like authors like that. Cool. Thanks. Mm-hmm. I have a Jane. question. Yeah, yeah. Hey, go um, for it, Jane. Yeah, first of all, thanks for uh, doing this. This is awesome. Um, I guess I'll try to make this quick, but in context, I happen to be a Christian, so that that kind of informs my worldview and 
my approach to everything. I'm curious if you could speak on, there seems to be a, um, a, a trend on, on Twitter, through Twitter spaces and, and all of that, you know, uh, one, one issue voters around Bitcoin and as a Christian, I, I struggle with that, not, not struggle with that in me, but struggle with the fact that people could think that, right? There's so many other mm-hmm. things as a Christian, like mm-hmm. a, a, abortion, I'm just going to be honest, right? Mm-hmm. That, mm-hmm. And, and there's a guy that's fairly popular, it seems these days, and I, I'm not going to name his name and he's a nice enough guy, but you know, he's, he's willing to support, uh, Democrats that are for abortion, but because they're for Bitcoin and their, and their opponent isn't, you know, mm-hmm. and anyway, I'm, I'm sure you could see where I'm going with this. I'm just curious mm-hmm. what your thoughts are on that. Yeah. So great question. Um, so my, my thinking on like, sort of like politics, democracy and voting as a Christian have evolved quite a bit. So I, I think the conventional view is that, you know, oh, Christians need to go out and vote because that's how they get their voice heard. And, you know, the, uh, and that, that's how the, you know, that's how you participate in a democracy and so on. Traditionally, this has never been the case. This is not something like that the Bible speaks about at all, because, uh, you know, traditional societies usually had a king of some kind, uh, or if they were uh, a non-monarchy, then it was sort of like a decentralized sort of society with various free cities and so on, kind of like um, in the book of Judges, where everyone sort of did their own thing. Um, so voting is a very weird thing to moralize about because it's a fairly new construct. Um, and it's it, it's uh, like democracy itself is a fairly new construct as well. Uh, you know, we've had republics in uh, Roman times and so on, but at least representative democracy that we're used to that the that we're under only maybe like 300 years old. It's 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 not that new. And uh, and to. And it's it's kind of strange how uh, like voting has sort of entered uh, Christian morality as as like sort of like a moral imperative, um, and that that's a little com- like I and I've come to this conclusion after a lot of thought on this uh, because in a sense like voting is a convenient way for uh, for people to think that they participated in something when they haven't. So one one of my big things that uh, that that I complain about is how voting sort of like uh, corporatizes virtue. Uh, so a lot of people think by voting to feed the poor that they are actually being charitable. Uh, that voting to uh, you know fund orphans makes them like good people. Um, that's not the same thing. What you're what you're saying is let's steal from everybody else so we can fund these programs that I think are morally superior. So I, I'm not sure that voting is necessarily a moral imperative. I know I know this a pop uh, this is not very popular among Christians to say something like that, but I I really don't I I, I don't think it's a moral imperative. I I don't think it's virtuous in any way. It's uh it's something that's uh more or less been co-opted by those in power. Um, and th- this happens a lot in the church where culture and Christian and gospel sort of like mix together and, uh, and sort of like are presented as the same thing when in fact they're not. And uh, I can speak to this specifically because I grew, grew up in the Korean American church. And one of the things that they do in the Korean American church is you know, show respect to your elders and like bow to them and stuff like that. And that's a very cultural thing. It doesn't say anything like that in the Bible, but that's something that's sort of expected of you growing up in the Korean church. Um, and, you know, going into the American church, I can see sort of like similar things, right? Like um, there, there's a very strong emphasis on individualism, which I don't necessarily see in the Bible that a lot of churches emphasize. Uh, you know, it's your personal faith. It's, you know, stuff like that. Um, you know, households are almost entirely ignored from a theological perspective. It's, you know, here's how you should treat your children and stuff like that, but not like an, as an entire household, which is very biblical. So I would say um, with the issue of voting, I, w- uh, I, w- I, I think it's sort of in that same realm. Uh, there, there's a cultural assumption that it's moral. 
Um, and in fact, every everybody on TV tells you that on any side tells you voting is a civic duty. It's very important that you should always do it, that it's uh, showing your preferences, that it's a moral imperative. Um, and I don't know if I believe that. Um, and I, I stopped voting years ago, in part because I thought the choices were false, that I, they were. I, yeah. Sorry, I was <laughs> just going to ask one thing or, or maybe comment on one thing. Mm -hmm. And I agree that um, it, it puts a Christian in a really bad spot to have to, quote unquote, vote for the lesser of two evils, if you will. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you mm -hmm. only have two options and you can't actually morally get behind either one of them, what good does it do to vote? for either one. Mm. And there's a lot of pressure on that, mm. to your point. So thank you for your perspective. Yeah, I. but ultimately, I, I think the deeper question is, aren't there bigger concerns, right? Like abortion, um, which uh, if you see it as murder, yeah, there, there's no other issue that's going to matter uh, than, than abortion. And I, I do know people like that, and I respect them. The thing is, it's a representative democracy. It's mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of this weird amalgamation of uh, of governance uh, that I, I'm not sure is necessarily right. Uh, and um, you know, like making abortion illegal, I think I could support that as a Christian. But you know, is that more important than other stuff? Well, that that's sort of like trying to weigh out moral values. And it, it's it's a much more complex calculation because, you know, like if you believe as I do that like having sound money changes a whole lot of stuff, right? Like including long-term incentives and what, what people do and, and so on. Um, you know, like these are, I, I don't think we're supposed to make the, uh, we're, we're, we're supposed to be put in positions like this to make those decisions, uh, like to make something illegal or to make something legal, like it's basically making us all kings. And we know what happens to kings that have absolute authority. They tend to get corrupted by power. Um, and in a sense, like the entire democratic world has sort of fallen into that psychosis where they think they can control everybody else, which is what both sides are doing. Um, and I, I, I don't know if that's really good. Uh, I, I, I'm for liberty. I'm for letting people sort of like make their own choices and letting the creator judge, uh, you know, what, what, what they've done, like preventing certain things and, you know, like, like forcing certain things, um, I don't know, it, it, it can be very, uh, and it oftentimes like it's hard to make that economic calculation, right? Because you don't know the unseen consequences of a policy like, OK, we're going to roll back Roe v. Wade as a constitutional amendment, say, say something like that happens. Well, what, what are all the unseen effects of doing that? <laughs> what, what are like, can we say that it's going to be all positive or even all negative or, you know, like, I don't know, like the, this is not something that humans should be deciding yet. You know, a lot of people have the conceit to think that this is like that. We know that this like think about the last 18 months. How many people said we should lock down and mm. do X, Y or Z and had the conceit to say that and, you know, can't admit they're wrong after it's been proven that they're wrong. You know, like it's I, I, I don't know if those are decisions that humans should make for everybody else or. You know, and democracy is kind of a form of that, if that makes sense. I, I rambled a little bit, but hopefully well, it's, it's, it's good. I think we might pick this up later uh, and really ask the question, how do we even build society? You know, how does the future on a Bitcoin standard look like for sports, for politics, for, you know, government, uh, et cetera? Uh, I've been asking this question in the little Bitcoin circle here in Iceland, and I think there's a lot more work we need to work or do in that area. Uh, we're going to wrap this up. Our time is up. Thank you, everyone. Uh, but before we close, uh, Jimmy, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. This is absolutely fantastic. Uh, do you want to give us any kind of a handle or uh, where we can follow you, uh, you know, read your stuff, et cetera? Yeah, so my Twitter is uh, at Jimmy Song. Um, my uh, website is programmingbitcoin.com. 
Um, my newsletter is jimmysong.substack.com and you can reach me on those channels. Great. We're going to add this to the podcast show notes. We're going to publish this as a podcast. We're going to do our next session two weeks from now, October 12th. Uh, our topic will be around knowledge and how can we trust knowledge? How do we uh, acquire knowledge, etc.? Um, I am working on a speaker. I will announce that as that gets clear. I remind everyone that we have a Telegram group called Bitcoin Worldview, where we can have ad hoc uh, conversations in between sessions. Uh, otherwise, thank you, everyone. This was great. I hope you enjoyed this first episode of the Bitcoin Worldview podcast. Jimmy did a great job and I encourage you to pick up one of his books and follow his content online. In our next episode, we will focus on the topic of knowledge. Bitcoin is a communication protocol of distributed decentralized databases. Bitcoin also has the slogan of don't trust verify. So is communication possible and how, if at all, can we trust the knowledge that we acquire through our senses? If you want to join that conversation on Zoom, ask questions and make comments, sign up on bitcoinworldview.live. Hope to see you there. Until then, goodbye.